You're watching The Wellness Howard, news that makes you healthier. I'm Randy Alvarez. Uh, my first guest, uh, most people know who he is. Uh, he is the author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. He's also uh, a New York Times bestseller on at least 10 other books. He has sold probably more than 50 million books worldwide. Uh, his books have been translated in more than 15 languages. Uh, he is just as relevant today as he was when I first saw him 25 years ago. Uh, the guest is, and uh, if you're in a relationship or considering ever getting a relationship, you have to hear what uh, Dr. John Gray has to say. We're gonna take a quick break. We come back and we're gonna jump right into it with Dr. Gray. We'll be right back. John, welcome to the program. Well, thank you so much. I'm excited to be with you. Now you wrote one of the most best-selling books of all time. So how'd you come up with the idea? Well, before I wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, I'd been a marriage counselor about 12 years. And the, the idea to, that Men Are From Mars started with just that men and women are different, which back in the late 70s, early 80s was a very controversial idea. But I saw that if you expect your partner to think the way you do, and you expect your partner to feel and respond when they love you the way you do, you're always gonna be disappointed because we're different. So it was about learning to correctly in interpret many of the common uh, misinterpretations from men and women. And I kept trying to find a fun, easy way to communicate it and then thought of, uh, well, what if we're from different planets? And then people <laughs> laughed and I said, okay, we'll go with that. Now, uh, aside from the physical differences, what's the primary difference as you see it between men and women in relationships and how well, they communicate? Now, in my later work, because I had to defend my observations psychologically and emotionally between men and women, I now have an arsenal of understanding of biological differences, and particularly our hormonal differences that give rise to different needs, wishes, intentions, reactions, responses, our different memories and so forth. So some of the basic ideas psychologically is you just listen to people's complaints. Almost every woman when they came to counseling would say something like, you know, my husband, he never listens to me. He doesn't, he doesn't care. He doesn't listen. And I'm a husband. My wife would say I don't listen and I cared and I, I knew just what she said. I could repeat it back to her. Uh, so, so what I found again and again is that women were complaining men don't listen and men were not. Uh, only time men would complain a woman doesn't listen is when a woman was complaining to him. And he, she'd say, you're not listening to me. He'd say, well, you don't listen to me either. But when men, when men are thinking about getting a divorce, their messages are completely different than a woman's. Uh, men will often say, John, no matter what I do, it's never enough to make her happy. It's just not enough. Because men are designed you know, to be motivated for success. And if you don't feel successful at home, you just don't feel the excitement, the connection, the passion anymore. And, and people today, more so than any other generation in the past, we, we want to have love and we want passion. And for men to have, you know, you can love your partner, but if you don't feel successful, you'll lose desire and passion and motivation and interest. You still love her, but you don't have all those other things. And, and women, on the other hand, uh, basically, when they want a divorce, you, you hear these messages and it's almost the same message, but opposite from men. Women are not saying, gee, no matter what I do, it doesn't make him happy. <laughs> they don't care about his happiness when they're ready to get a divorce. <laughs> they're saying, no matter what I do, I give and give and give. I'm not getting what I need. I'm not, he's not giving to me. He's not attentive. He's not supportive. He does not consider it. He doesn't listen. You know, she's looking at what she's not give, getting back. And he's looking at, I give, but it's never enough. And so that gives us a hint into some of the big differences between men and women. Are, are, are these emotional and psychological differences, do you think, inborn or acquired? They're biological. They're completely, well, you know, everything is, everything about our behavior we're taught, okay? So behaviors are taught, attitudes are taught. What does it be to man? What is it to be a woman, etc. cetera? This is our conditioning. But what I focus on is really the differences that are universal in every country in the world, not spoken in over 50 countries. So, and everybody goes, yeah, my husband does the same thing. Yeah, my wife does the is same that right? thing. Yeah, everywhere. China. I, I spend, you know, a tenth of the year in China. I'm going to Russia next week. I go there. I go to Europe. I go to Africa. I go to South America. Everywhere. You'll see almost the same kind of friction where friction shows up. It's often where women will want to talk and open up and men who are like uh, always problem solving. Men will interrupt and try to solve the problem. And many times a woman just wants to be heard. 
And in some cultures, women just don't talk to men because men don't know how to listen in a way that a woman wants to be heard. And, and, and today, because women are, the more women are independent and educated and so forth, those are testosterone producing activities. Now that's our male side. Men have 10 to 30 times to 50 times more testosterone than women. When women go over to their male side, their female hormones go down. And when their female hormones go down, they're stressed. They're not happy. They don't sleep well. This is biological. We know this now. Everybody's trying to give women hormonal injections to make them happy when really men have the power to provide a certain kind of support that women can that allows a woman to give herself the certain kind of support that will increase her estrogen, her progesterone, her prolactin. Uh, her oxytocin, these are all very key hormones that help women to feel better and therefore her needs in relationship are different and the more women are on their male side, the more they need to come back to their female side and good okay. com communication for example, where a woman feels heard and seen and understood, this helps her to come back into balance. You know, to me, as a therapist, it was a mystery in the beginning. Women came in unhappy, I listened, I asked questions and I made a point of not giving solutions to much, much later in the therapy process. But what would happen is they would come in unhappy, talk about their feelings and leave happy and nothing changed in their life. And that is mastery. That's what women need to learn is the power of being able to talk from a woman's body about your feelings, positive and negative, without trying to change somebody and you'll feel better. Then when you're feeling better, you can learn to give your partner what they need to make them love you more and then you'll get what you need or you can ask what you need and get it. But simply demanding more, asking for more, complaining for more, when your partner's not feeling loved and supported in his needs, you'll never get more, you only get less. And this is what happens to couples and relationships and I help them turn it around. So if you had the, like what are the top three communication roadblocks uh, okay, men and uh, women have? Again, we have, to, we have to look at traditional relationship which many people live in more conservative, and then there's the more uh, uh, liberal relationships where women are more like men. So my most recent book is more for as women are becoming more independent, what are the big roadblocks? But women who are like with children and you're dependent on your husband, you're expecting him to provide for you, you're not completely out there supporting you know, yourself and your family. So the three big roadblocks there are when women talk, men don't understand that women talk for various reasons and one of those reasons is to lower their stress. If a woman could just talk about her day, uh, she can actually feel better, even in politics. You know, my wife is very political, I'm very political, and actually can bring you closer together because she has a lot to complain about. So when she complains about politics, I just listen and say, tell me more, and really, and get her to talk more because when women talk more and feel heard, there's a connection that increases their female hormones and their stress goes down. Men don't have to talk so much. Uh, basically, what I teach men is practice taking cave time. When you take cave time, at the end of the day, you gotta stop working. Modern men, the more modern guy, he's working all the time and he's gonna run out of testosterone and lose his libido for his partner. He needs to take cave time, which means downtime. Used to be a hobby. Now you just watch the news or read a book or meditate or pray or, or go to weight lift, something that doesn't involve personal interactions for you to actually rebuild testosterone, to detach from all your problems. Forget your problems, do something you enjoy that doesn't have to do with your relationship. So for a guy, it might be like watching football or watching absolutely. the news or whatever. He may have to be left alone, is that what you're saying? That women yes, need to understand, yes. just let him have his half hour. His space, that's called the okay. cave time. Now what happens is when men take their cave time, women, they don't understand male physiology. I've got 40 times more testosterone in my wife to rebuild after a day of a stressful work. If it's not so stressful, I don't have to rebuild that much, but if it's a stressful day or I'm working hard, if I'm using my muscles, I will actually run out of testosterone. And the only way I can rebuild testosterone is spend about half an hour in a context where I'm not producing estrogen. Estrogen is the female hormone in my body that lowers testosterone. If I'm holding my children, I'm giving love to my wife, listening to have a conversation, talking about my feelings, my estrogen will go up yeah. and my testosterone can't rebuild. And over time, I'll have this low testosterone level that so many men have today. Now you're getting injections and shots and mine, I'm 65 years old, they're 25% higher than I'm a young man because I feel successful at home and in my job. It's all about success for men. 
But, you know, you don't have to be Superman. You just have to have a wife, you know, think you're wonderful and it will pump your testosterone up. But if a woman is complaining or feeling unloved or unsupported, you can't feel successful at home. And one of the reasons women would be so unhappy in marriage is when their husband took this cave time, she would think, oh, he doesn't love me. He's not interested in me. He doesn't care about me. Oh, he's angry at me. Because quite often women will take cave time. They won't talk. They want to be quiet. They pull away when they're mad at you. Oh, they stop loving you and they start going off on their own. So women completely misinterpret a man's cave time. Now, for the modern man, modern men aren't even taking cave time. They're either on their female side where they feel guilty taking cave time or they're too far on their male side and they're working all the time. They don't stop working because we can work all the time on our computers. In both cases, his testosterone levels will low. Now, when testosterone levels go out of balance, symptoms are you become angry. When, ang when testosterone is low, not high, people always associate anger and aggression with high testosterone. No, we've proven now it's estrogen goes high. The female hormones are going high. So when you're angry men, don't talk. Whatever you're angry about, forget it for a little while. It's bad on your body, it's bad on your heart pressure, and it's terrible for your marriage to get, express anger. Yet men do it, they get out of control because often women will ask him all these questions and it irritates him, annoys him, pulls him out of the cave, they get in arguments and it's disastrous. This is why there's so many divorces today and not so many people lose the passion is we gotta accept and embrace and understand we need to come together but we also have to have time apart. Now in your book, do you have stories people must email you where they have reversals, where things were pretty bad, they follow the principles, they follow your strategies, they understand each other better, and now they've got a great relationship? Has that, does that happen? There, yes, wherever I go, besides letters and, and so forth, wherever I go, because I travel you know, 10 days a month, and that's my deal with my wife. Otherwise, I, I do it all the time. I love my work, but I love my wife too. And, but the, uh, every time in the airport, without a doubt, without any exception, somebody comes up to me and say, we read your book, it saved our marriage. Many people come up and they say, we read your book, we were divorced, we got back together. Many people say, oh my gosh, you know, because of you, I got married, I made him read the book. Or some guys say, you know, we dating, we read your book together and now we're happily married. The whole gamut, I get this everywhere I go for the last 25 years. Now, you know, I, uh, well-known psychiatrist, Dr. Amen, he doesn't do relationships, but he says when they, because he's a psychiatrist and MD, people will ask him relationships. And he says, he tells them, get the book, get, get your book. And that's uh, so nice of him. That's great. He wrote the forward to one of my books as well. Uh, okay. I, I have a book on brain chemistry between men and women, and he wrote the forward to it. He was very generous. So, so is it old thinking that, especially with women now working, many of them breadwinners in the family, so are the, is the thinking that women are just emotional and men are logical, is that no longer the case? Is that no longer the current thinking? Well, the, the, the division between men, the line has become blurred because the more women work to be, the more women are independent, the more self-reliant a woman is, the more educated a woman is to be independent, and the more she's dependent on herself for finances. All those conditions push her to her male side, stimulating male hormones, activating male aspects of her brain. Those aspects of her brain are the logical part of her brain. She becomes less emotional as a result of that. She becomes less nurturing as a result of that. She feels less happiness as a result of that, unless she can go back to her female side. We have the ability to switch. We can go, you know, be one way. You know, I'm this tough guy out in the world fighting for, you know, relationships and confronting my, cl my clients in a very loving way. But I come home with my grandchildren. There's none of that there. You know, it's just I go right into my female nurturing side. I do it as a man does it, but still my estrogen levels are going up, up, up. And ironically, I mean, I love it. The female side of us is the only part of us that can feel. That's the feeling side. It's the loving side. It's the happy side. It's the upset side, positive or negative. That's the female hormones are being produced at that time. And when I'm with my grandkids, I go so far over to my female side that afterwards I need to take a long nap. <laughs> <laughs> I could work, I could do this work for 24 hours a day and not know I was tired. Just bang, bang, bang. I'm so good at it, it's easy, I'm successful at it. I teach, I just taught a seminar this week and I talked for nine hours for two days in a row, not tired at all. How does that happen? Because I'm in my male side doing something that I'm good at, I'm successful at, getting lots of recognition. 
But if I go home and take care of my grandkids, I'm ready to, I'm ready to take a long nap. Interesting. I'm, having, I'm in a slight coma. <laughs> so, uh, look, I think arguably, I mean, you're one of the world experts on this topic of relationships and communication. So is it are, to you today, are you more leaning toward it's more physiological or more psychological? Or a little bit of oh, both. Well, what, what I had, to, what the I've problems. done, because of the scientific research, I'm looking at the biological basis of these differences. I've always looked at it as biological. We come into this world massively different. Any parent who has a boy and a girl sees the differences. Okay. They're huge, and they continue through life. But then we have a culture, and the culture can either either shame you for being feminine, shame you for being masculine. And as I train women, I do women-only trainings, and I train them how to be feminine. The first step is, is I get them to get in touch with their feelings and be truthful about what they're feeling. They go, oh, I don't want to go there. It feels weak. It feels needy. And I go, that is your female side, but it's not weak. Female power is the power to get other people to do things for you. And you're not just female. You can do things for yourself. But do you want to do everything for yourself? Isn't there a part of you that wants somebody to do things for you? Yes, of course there is. And that's the female side. And female power is the power to attract people to do things for you. That's what love does. If you're full of love, people trust you better, whether you're a man or woman. That's my female side. Helps me be successful because I'm trustworthy. I have love. I'm joy. I have fun. You know, I did my thing on Broadway. It was funny. It was a show. It was because uh, you're having fun. It's everybody's having fun. So you, that's the female side of us. The male side of us is serious. It's motivated. It has goal oriented. It sacrifices. It's detached. You do what you have to do. You don't whine. You don't complain. And culture used to tell men to do all those things. And culture told women to do those other things, the nurturing things. Okay. And that's the way the world's been. Now we're, we've left that behind. We've opened up and said, hey, we can be all that we want to be. And, and that when you release repressed parts of who you are, a huge amount of energy comes forth. So women are like liberated and free to be independent. But they're kind of caught over there now and can't get back to their female hormones. And many men sort of are liberated to sort of follow their heart and do what they like and do what they want and not yeah. make sacrifice. And so they can't make commitment. I mean, they don't want to give up the freedom of one lady after another or whatever. They don't get the whole value of building something and creating a relationship. But really, I think deep inside, every man wants to do that. It's just he doesn't get married, doesn't commit because he doesn't know how to, to, okay. to, to feel confident that the relationship could last because it doesn't last today. And one of the reasons is that today, more than any other generation, we want to continue to feel desire along with love. But the hormones of love push the hormones of desire down unless you know how to create the balance. And that's the whole key to this is women have to come over to the hormones of love. Men have to come back to the hormones of motivation and desire. But that's testosterone is desire and love is estrogen. These are biological realities and we want to keep them in balance. So the right balance, theoretically, you know, everything's a little different for everybody. But generally speaking, every man has at least 10 times more testosterone than a woman. Now, some men have 30 times more, but the bottom rung of the ladder is the 30, 10 times more. Every woman has 10 to 20 times more estrogen than a man. And so if she's in her balanced female side, men will be attracted to her. But if she's not, she's not going to be attracted to men or men won't be attracted to her. There's sort of an attraction thing, which allows the passion to last. And, you know, I know it can last. I have a marriage of 31 years. I've been married 31 years, together 40 years, and we still have the passion. It comes in waves and we know how to do that. You know, like right now, I'm not missing my wife. I'm working, whatever. Then I come home, the passion comes back. So it's learning to allow it to come back. Many couples want that. They love each other. They come to me for counseling, but they don't desire each other. That's gone. And they want to know what happened. And what happened is too many male hormones in the woman and too many female hormones and too low male hormones in the man. That's really what happens for men is our testosterone's going down and women's estrogen's going down and we're losing that mix. Now, if you suddenly started a new relationship, the newness, the challenge the unknown would give you a burst of that, but it wouldn't last for long. And that's why half of the people who get married today get divorced. The ones who are getting divorced are usually the ones who are wanting passion and aliveness and they're missing it in their marriage. The 70% of second marriages end and almost 90% of third marriages end. And that's because those are your sort of early adopter people who say, you know, I want 
the possibility of passion and desire. Yeah. It, it just goes away. And some people are like old fashioned. They go, oh, that's that's normal. We'll just be content. But the reality is you can have lasting passion. And that's what I'm teaching people the techniques for doing it. Okay. In your new book, Beyond Mars and Venus, how's it different than your first book? Well, it's very different. And, in who, that, and, and who should read this book? Two questions. Oh, oh anybody could read this book. Anybody. Who have, it's like a woman learning about about her own body, her own hormones, her own moods and why they change and what she needs. You see, people say to me, well, I know what I need. I say, if you're really happy all the time, you do know what you need. If you're not happy and fulfilled, you don't know what you need. You think you know what you need. It's like the alcoholic who thinks I need my alcohol. <laughs> That's what I need. The drug addict is, no, I need my drug. No, they don't know what they need. They're missing out on what the real needs are in life. And so it's like what I define very clearly, this 12 attributes of femininity and the 12 attributes of masculinity and the biological basis of that. And then you understand if I'm stressed, how I can come back into balance. And this would be true for anybody in the modern world. Uh, the ideas of Minute from Mars are scattered throughout this new book, but showing that as, you know, as men and women move into this new era, this complex world, men are working all the time. They're not taking their cave time. In the Minute from Mars book, I'm addressing that most men did take their cave time and women misunderstood it. So it's, a, it's adding the new dimension of the new challenges, but the biological differences, the basic scheme of men and women is the same as it's been for thousands and thousands of years. It just has a new outfit due to our relationships with new challenges. So your thought, are your thoughts that, that, that women, you know, working women, busy women, busy men, we tend to lose ourselves? In our work sometimes, like a woman? Well, it, it, losing yourself is kind of an abstract concept, but biologically, your hormones go out of balance. You lose a part of yourself, okay? If you're a woman and you're a, you're a leader in a business and everybody depends upon you and there's a bottom line and there's a crisis, all of your male hormones will get produced way above their normal level and your female hormones will go way down now you're going to go to your doctor asking for hormones because you can't sleep at night, or you're going to take antidepressants, or you're going to be drinking six cups of coffee, whatever. We're going to take some kind of stimulant, some kind of medication to find balance, or we're not, and we're just going to be unhappy. What I'm teaching is relationship skills can stimulate the right balance of hormones. So I point out the symptoms of too much testosterone in a woman, how to come back to the female side. And somebody might be, you know, we know that libido has to do with testosterone. Somebody might be thinking, well, shouldn't women have more testosterone? They, if they want to have libido, they also have to have oxytocin first and a little extra testosterone and much higher estrogen levels. And just being in your male side all day kills your female side. So you it's show just, them uh, how, and you can see it. So you show them how to transition into their female side more often, often? Every day, every day, how to come back to your female side and for men, how to come back to the, their masculine energy and rebuild their testosterone levels. The average in America is at 35, men's testosterone levels are beginning to drop. That's not the way we're designed. It, the way, it's so common that people say that's the normal, but that's, if you go to indigenous societies, men's testosterone levels never drop after puberty. They go up like 10, 15 times, they stay there. They're a grown man their whole life, they have that testosterone. But what happens in, a, in an indigenous person, and in myself as well, because I know these skills, your testosterone stays high, but your estrogen now starts rising with every year. So that's sort of the wise grandfather who, who stays calm, who's more loving, who's more compassionate, he's lived life more, so there's more empathy, which is female qualities. But he's like right awake, he's present, his brain's working, he's got, he may not have the full muscle mass he used to have, <laughs> I don't have that, but I've got a lot more confidence than I've ever had. That's testosterone. So communication styles can uh, affect your hormones. Oh, I love bringing up communication styles. So one of the basics from Men Are From but, Mars. But, but one of the things that I, okay. and I, 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 yep. I listened to one of your audio books and you were saying that communication can bring your passion back. Help me yes. understand that as well. Yeah, that's the most important thing. So. It, one of the concepts in Men Are From Mars is that women need to talk to cope with stress and to experience intimacy. So she's talking, expressing her feelings, and somebody's actually listening and not interrupting with solutions, but just basically no magic here. Just tell me more. Help me understand that better, kind of like interviewing without trying to you know, fix somebody. So rather than fix, which is what we men always want to do, help solve the problem that she needs, which is to come back into balance 
by not fixing, but connecting, asking questions and not talking much. That's men's biggest problem today is once women start talking, we start talking. It should be a one way street if she's upset. So let me ask you this. Let let me back up for just a moment. So the only time a man should actually offer a solution to the problem is if we're asked directly? If there's a problem and we're not upset about it. Okay. Because women will not hear any of your solutions, basically, if they're upset with you. (laughs) If you're part of their problem or they're upset, what happens when we're upset is there's a fight or flight mechanism going on in both men and women. And blood flow doesn't go to the front part of the brain where we can hear another point of view. But if a man is not trying to interrupt and solve a woman's problem, he can stay cool, calm, and collected. And by asking questions and listening more and, and, and trying to elicit feelings from her, if she can, at first women are not good at this, they'll just complain about things, but eventually they start to share their feelings about those things, their emotions. Then when their emotions begin to come forth, massive amounts of estrogen get produced in their body. That's why when people come to me, I have a waiting list when I have my practice and when I open it up again, I have a long waiting list, is that women primarily come to me because what they'll experience is no matter what their stress is in life, listening, if I listen to them for 30, 45 minutes, asking these questions that elicit feeling safety and creating a safety for her emotions to come up, she'll suddenly feel better. I mean, men need to get this, that 90% of people who go to therapy are women because they're going to pay some person to just listen to them. That's what happens in counseling is the women talk. And if she can talk, she will feel better. But if she talks and she's trying to change someone, it doesn't work as well. So I have to train women how to talk in a way to increase their estrogen, which is to share with their partner problems of their day and the feelings that came up about their day and not about their husband. Because if you complain to your husband about your husband, he's gonna become defensive instantly. And women think, why should he be defensive? Because every human being, if you complain to them, will become defensive. If I tell my wife, why are you complaining so much? She's gonna get defensive. But women can, when they start feeling heard, they do have less complaints. Because what happens in women is these complaints build up and then they come out and they tend to focus on their partner. But if she can begin moderate, uh, lowering the stress in her life by talking about the traffic and the kids and the doctor and the employees and the fix it and the computer went down and this traffic jam, these are the things of life. If women can begin to talk about those things to their spouse, it raises their estrogen. And the more independent a woman is, the more sort of in her male side she is, the less aware she is of those things, one. Two, the less willing she's going to talk about it. So you have to have instruction to tell somebody who's addicted to a drug, that drug is not working for you. And women become addicted to not being in touch with their feelings until they blow up. They get addicted to doing and doing and doing. That's their male side. And it becomes an addiction because it frees them from having to look at their female feelings, which are vulnerable. Strong women do not want to show vulnerability. It takes a huge amount of courage to share these feelings that make you look weak to make you look like you need someone, to make you look like you can't do something and you need help. To many women today, just to say, I need help is like, ah, if I say that, who would ever love me? And part of why they fear that is because when a man goes too far to his female side and says, I need help and cries, women go, okay, I'll be his mother, but I don't want to make love to him. (laughs) Interesting. So, so, so strategy number one, that, that sounds like an easy one because we, you know, women are going into your practice, your private practice, confiding in you, he won't listen, right? So if the guys just listen to their day without judging, without snags of advice, she'll get it all out. She'll feel better about herself and, uh, and that- She'll appreciate you more. And that, She'll that, appreciate that, you Now what more. about the flip side? Because I know you brought, it up, you brought it up in your book about the unsolicited advice. So women, men are known for trying to solve problems when they're not asked. Women, uh, I think according to maybe your book, that they give unsolicited advice. So, so what do you yeah, do? Yeah, well, well, okay, so here's how the advice thing goes. Again, it's kind of like, well, I give advice, well, she gives advice. Focus is women tend to give advice to men about what they should do, and that's what annoys us the most. I call that unsolicited advice. Okay. And men will tend to give advice to women on how they should feel, and that's what really, that's the vulnerable part for women. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. We're giving advice on, you should feel this way about it. That's what we, that's our mistake. Wow. We make to women is that we tell them, well, you shouldn't be upset about that. 
well, that's not a big deal. Don't worry about that. Mm. Why would you be angry with that person? You know, this and this and this. So we want to discount her negative emotions and we think that's going to make her feel better. But to de discount her negative emotions lowers estrogen. That's why she doesn't feel good. Now, if you're if we're two buddies talking and you're complaining about something, I say, oh, don't worry about that. It's no big deal. You know, you'll handle that. Oh, why even waste your energy being angry with that loser? You know, we can say that to each other and we say it to ourselves as a way to detach. Because when you detach from these negative emotions, what happens is your testosterone goes up. And you can do that by choice if somebody's told you that's the direction to go. Unfortunately, everything in psychology of the last 30 years is telling everybody to not detach, but to get emotional and express your emotions and talk about your emotions. That's great for women, not great for men. Men should feel their emotions. They should just feel it and then be aware, okay, I'm getting emotional. Let me detach for a little while because I'm getting stressed. I'm talking about negative emotions. Let me not speak. Most important thing is don't speak or make decisions when you're having negative emotions. Next thing, say, I'm gonna temporarily forget it. Forget it, don't worry about it. You know, it's like two guys fighting. What you do, you pull them off. And you don't say, okay, now you guys, let's talk to each other. No, you just say, that guy's a jerk, let's go outside. You kind of get him out of the view. You, and then you can calm down. You gotta calm down once you calm down, that means your test, you're back in control. Your testosterone comes up. Then the more enlightened guy reflects on what just happened that upset him with his wife or situation. And then he goes from a centered place and he expresses himself in a more loving place and gives her a chance to settle down. But many women, they don't know what to do to settle down because being quiet or going lifting weights is not going to do it. Going for a run may help her escape it a bit, but it's not going to get the estrogen up. What's going to get the estrogen up if she goes and talks to a therapist, talks to a friend, or talks in her journal with the intention that I just want to listen to my own feelings, not demand my partner to do it, listen to my own negative feelings of blame and resentment and doubt, all kinds of stuff nobody wants to hear, and listen to it. Then come, by listening, this amazing thing, estrogen levels go up if you feel heard. The stress goes down. And when stress goes down, we start to remember all the good things in our life. That's what happens to women a lot is when they're stressed, they forget all the good things a guy's done and they just sort of focus on the negative. That's the inevitable response of cortisol going up. When cortisol goes down, they'll tend to remember all the good stuff, which makes Eh, well, he does. He is a bit messy. He doesn't always remember things. Oh, he's an okay guy, but I love him. I love him. And they'll remember the good things. So we can help women come back to that estrogen side of her where she can find the good things in herself and in others. That's learning these skills. And like you said, it sounds so simple. It's a little harder to put into practice. <laughs> so if we, could listen, if, we could listen with, if we could listen without trying to fix it, we're naturally going to lower her stress hormones and That's she can't help but reciprocate in her head by saying, he's not such a bad guy. My That's husband exactly listens right. to me. That's exactly right. You just figured it all out right there. <laughs> so now, what, that, that, do you believe that women are more complicated than men, that men are easier, kind of like dogs, right? Like feed well, us. Well, <laughs> I'm okay calling myself like a dog, but not some guys are too on their female side and they take offense at that. <laughs> but, but yes, we, from our point of view, and when you understand men, we are very, very simple. And when you understand women, they are very complicated. However, knowing that some women are listening, if you say to a woman, men are really simple, they go, no, he's not simple because they have all these complicated misinterpretations of us. <laughs> so, so from our point, we are so simple. Feed us. <laughs> okay. Don't, just don't complain about us. Appreciate what we can do. Ask for more in small increments. That's the whole thing. If women could just know we feel more loved if we make a mistake and you don't get upset with us, we actually feel more love than if you did 10 things for, for us. It's like it's a woman's response to us that makes us feel loved. For women, it's what we do for them and what we create for them, the safety we provide, the actions we do, what we provide for them is what makes them feel loved. But for us, it's not, you know, women provide for us, great. 
But when men are winning a divorce, it's not because my wife's a lousy cook, you know, or my, <laughs> my wife is at home enough. It's basically, he, I, he says, I try, I try, and nothing works, nothing works. And then I help these guys because I point out to them, what you're doing doesn't work because it doesn't work. There's just, hmm. you know, it's like when women say, I, how can I know what they really need? I go, hey, if you're happy and fulfilled, then you know what you need. But if a woman is not happy and fulfilled, she does not know what she needs most. And what women will often do to get what they need, and they do know that they need to feel seen and heard and so forth, but what they'll do is they'll see and hear a man. They'll like go and ask him a lot of questions and what are you doing and what's the matter and where are you going? And they show all this interest as if we want that. Very few men want that. And they only want it if on their female side, and then I tell them don't want that. <laughs> Come back to your male wow. side. If you're having stress in your life, that's the key. See, when I'm not stressed, I'm on both my male and female side. Like I'm having lots of fun with you. We're having a good time. My female side is the is the creative, having fun, a jovial. But the male side, remember, is we gotta, you know, gotta, you know, my my career is always at stake. I'm talking to the media. You know, fight or flight is you know kicking in there. You got to do the. You got to do your best. Got to look good. Got to make it happen. So, by the way, you speak in terms of that men and women can use the same words, but we have different meanings. Elaborate on that. Like same words, well, different again, meanings. Again, almost like we have certain example. clothes. Uh, here's an example, okay? So an example of that would be, I could say to my, I could say to, my wife could say to me, uh, hey John, what's the matter? I say nothing. I mean nothing's the matter, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you say to a woman sometimes, what's the matter? She goes, oh, nothing. And she means something. <laughs> She says, oh, nothing, and then implied nothing I want to tell you about because you don't care and you don't love me. <laughs> but, if so you have a, voice. but if you had a reputation of a, being a good listener, she may open up more? Oh, because, well, even, even but see, sometimes women are stressed, even not with you, of course, and they don't want to talk. I might say to my wife, uh, hey, what's the matter? She goes, oh, nothing, nothing. And she's thinking about a lot of things that are bothering her, but she's not going to tell me because she doesn't feel safe. And even with me, sometimes she won't tell me. And I'll say, did something happen at the office? And she goes, yeah, you know, this is that darn computer. The guy came by. We have to wait for him. You know, it never works when I go over there and the people aren't there when I want them. It's, you have to sort of create an opening to show her that you're interested and the reason for that is men are not aware of this, but so many times women start talking and our mind just drifts off somewhere else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, we, you know, yeah. we suddenly start thinking about, oh, that conversation, I had that problem I have to solve. What do I have to do about that? We just sort of drift away. And women notice that stuff. They like have extra antennas to <laughs> kind of go, is he listening to me? Is he not listening to me? <laughs> and so they start to feel like, well, gee, you know, why even bother talking to him? Because he's really not that interested in what I have to say. And I am not that interested in much of what my wife has to say, except that knowing this knowledge of Mars Venus, if I show interest, if I was interested, it would make her very happy. And because I know it's going to make her very happy, I actually become more and more interested because I, there's a payoff. Ultimately, men are interested in things that make them feel successful. You know, if we could... You know, if we could give big amounts of money for people who walked on their hands, you'd watch people walking on their hands all the time <laughs> and they love to do it. They love to learn how to do it. Now, you, you know, my father, who's 81 years old, married three times, he says, Randy, he goes, and he's not a well-read guy. You know, I, I couldn't force him to read your book, but he says, men and women are not supposed to live together. They're not, he, he lived a whole life just completely a mystery. So can your book help guys like that? But also, you know, I want to mention that it sounds like if, Every new couple, because this is like an instruction manual on how to get along, right? But every new couple, first two years, three years, should, should look at this as an, as an outline. You know, people say, yes. And people say to me, I, I, they give it to their kids now. You know, they, they want their kids to have this information. People say you should be teaching people in, in kindergarten this stuff. And it wouldn't be in the same format. But I taught my kids all along. You know, a little girl growing, I had three daughters. I have three daughters. But when they were growing up, they would see me sometimes being solely, totally present with them and at other times watching a sports game or watching the news. And they're kind of like, well, is that more important than me? And so when I taught them about the cave, they could go, oh, dad's in the cave. Don't bother him now. He'll be out of the cave soon. And then they could easily learn it wasn't, it, it wasn't taking it personally. 
because little girls take it a lot personally. I mean, they, they feel my father was distant. My father wasn't available to me. You know, when I'm doing uh, counseling for women who are grown and you go back to their childhood, they always have these issues about my dad wasn't there. He was always going. And actually what's often what the case is part of the time dad has pulled into his cave and then the little girl just assumed dad's not there for me because he doesn't just come home and happy to see me or he's happy to see me then he pulls away and well, what did I do to cause that to happen so at all stages there could be appropriate understanding of how boys and girls are different how men are different so, how so, daddies so, so are different if couples both especially a lot of people get married young 25 28 they're they're not thinking about these things but do you think if they just came to grips with the fact that men are different and women are different that that alone and then of course along with your book, that that alone will make for a much better relationship in the long run. Is that? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Even, in, I, you know, a minute from Mars in the, <clears throat> you know, single people will say to me often, my Mars Venus on a date was the best book for them because in the dating process, our differences show up a little differently than in the marriage process. So that's an interesting thing. And I'll give a little call out to the people who are dating and single which is what women will tend to do on a date, for example, is they give to the man the kind of support that if he gave to her would impress her the most. Hmm. In a sense, like yeah. if I love champagne, then I'm gonna go, hey, have some champagne. But what if that's not what they need most? Then you kind of go, oh, I don't like champagne that much. So give to the person what they need most. So women will tend to give what they think, what, what a woman wants most, because she doesn't understand men are different. So what would that look like? Well, what women want most is for a man to be interested in them and for a man to ask a lot of questions and for a man to be an interested listener. That's what women want most. That's how, and that's actually what raises estrogen in women. And that's what they tell you? Like in your private practice, this is what they tell you? Like he just doesn't care about my day. He doesn't listen to me oh, when I talk. Oh, it's the number one question really? women have, complaint women have is guys don't listen. And often guys will, women will say on days, oh, he just talked about himself the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Ironically, they'll say that, but at the same time, instinctively, they don't realize that they're asking him questions over and over. And see, in their mind, they think, if you're on Venus, okay, you don't know about Mars, and you're on Venus, and we're, and we're two girlfriends, if I want to talk to you and share myself, which is what women want to do, I don't, that would appear selfish. I can't just go for what I want. I have to give you what you want. So I'm going to ask you lots of questions and listen to you for five, ten minutes. Then you owe me five or ten minutes, <laughs> okay. and then I could be, I could expect now I get to talk and talk about myself. Women hate it when people talk about themselves. Who just talking about himself all the time, or she just called me and talked about herself. She didn't ask me any questions about me. I hear this from my daughters all the time, but and I hear from women just saying, you know, my husband doesn't care about me. He doesn't listen to me. He's not asking questions. Because listening and asking questions is the way women need to feel loved the most. So on a date, a woman will ask a guy a lot of questions. He'll start, it'll be this sort of awkward silence. So the woman will ask the guy questions. Guy will start talking and she expects that if he's interested in her, he'll ask questions back. You know, she asks a question, he asks a question, they go back yeah. and forth. But typically it will happen, a guy will ask, a, a woman will ask him the question, he'll start talking. And then she'll ask another question and another question. And the whole evening, he's talking if he's the talkative type. If he's not the talkative type, nothing happens. There's no there's awkward silence almost all the time. Women are the source of talking. So what women need to do is sort of ask a simple open-ended question about anything that's interesting to her. It's like, what did you think about the elections? Or what did you think about the concert that so-and-so came to town? Have you heard his music? Do you like his music? And you, and you try to avoid a yes or no answer. You know, what about his music do you like? Then a guy might talk a little bit or nothing. Doesn't matter. Make sure he doesn't talk too much and then respond with your point of view. Be courageous. Express everything you think times 10. Talk more okay. than the guy. It's called too much information, TMI. My daughter does all these courses on dating, my grown daughter, my website, and she coined the phrase TMI. Just too much information. So if he said, you know, I went to the election, I, I waited in line, you go, oh, I was waiting in line too, it was like crazy, you know, it seems like we're always waiting in line. Just the other day I was at the office and you know, the water thing broke and this, I'm waiting all the time and so-and-so told me this about that and then, you know, I went to the movie and even there they have lines. It's like, the whole place is becoming so busy these days, traffic everywhere, it wasn't this way when I first got here. Well, that was about six years ago. <laughs> Make sure you talk, that's called TMI. 
he'll be so relieved. And the other side of it, see, women are paranoid that if I share myself, that he won't be interested in me. And why do you want to be with a guy who does not interested in you if you share yourself? That guy, if he doesn't like what you have to say when you sort of open up your thoughts and feelings, if he can't be attracted to that, then he'll only be attracted to you physically if that. And after sex, he'll never call you back. You, you, you should test any guy before you have sex with him. Then he first hears what you think, how you feel, who you are. You know, there needs to be a bond there. Because if there's no bond there, then you get a one night stand. And that's what women complain about all the time today. They have sex with a guy, he never calls back, it's all over. Because he didn't know who she was. He was just attracted physically. Another difference between men and women is that when a man is faced with uh, feminine nudity or close to nudity, uh, he will become massively aroused in the, in the, in the, um, the back cortex of the brain, which has to do with sexuality. It just lights up. And if a woman sees a nude man, it doesn't light up at all. <laughs> it's just like it's totally different when it comes to that. There's a hormone called vasopressin. Uh, vasopressin, when it's present in a man's body, causes him to have an erection or causes him to be interested in a woman, causes him to even bond with her if there's a lot of vasopressin. If a woman has vasopressin, it will uh, cause her not to be sexual and she feels motherly towards the man. You see, whenever there's a, whenever there's a, uh, a person in distress and I'm the hero, okay, I'm gonna come in and solve the problem. You got a problem, I got the solution and it's a big deal and you go, wow, you saved the day. My vasopressin goes up and I bond with you. If, if you're a woman and there's a sexual biological uh, chemistry, I'll bond with you more because I did something for you. If a woman, had some sexual chemistry, but now she becomes the hero who saves the day and he like cries out and goes, thank you so much. Oxytocin gets, vasopressin gets produced in her, which turns off her sexual drive. Vasopressin turns off sexual drive for women. Vasopressin turns on sexual drive for men. Oxytocin, this hormone that, that is so good for women because it lowers their stress, increases their libido, allows women to have climax. They can't have climax without oxytocin. For men, oxytocin stops climax. Oxytocin is released when men have climax. That's why men can't do it again. That's why we have a refractory period. It's too much oxytocin lowers our testosterone. So oxytocin lowers testosterone in men. Oxytocin increases a woman's libido. So, with, a these, so with these communication strategies, you've seen couples that had no passion for each other, no sexual attraction for each other, and now they do. Yes, absolutely, exactly. without a doubt. Now, yes. now, what about those people that may it, it say- It had to be there at some point. Okay. There's always the thing, if there never was much, it's hard to, it's, it's, it's doesn't come back, because it wasn't there. There's other reasons for chemistry that have nothing to do with communication or anything. Communication and love and situation and circumstance allows the potential which is there to come forth. But you don't have that potential with everybody. That's a biological genetic uh, propensity. So if you had chemistry at the beginning, and yeah, you, you lost it, it you could get it back. Yeah, if, if you're willing. You know, some people just have so many problems together because of their history, they want to move on. But the couples that want to get it back, every, ca every case I've done over 40 years, it comes back. Sometimes it's a weekend seminar, sometimes it's several, several uh, therapy sessions, and sometimes it's just doing what I suggest you do in the book. More often that's the case, because I don't see the millions of people who've read my book but just think about it. Whenever I happen to be in the airport, whenever I'm standing in line, somebody says, you're the guy. You wrote the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and then they tell me, oh, my God, that changed my life. That was, you know, happily married. And boy, did it do good in the bedroom. I also have a book, Mars, Venus in the bedroom. People talk about that more than any of my books, actually. And they just say that's so good because we have differences outside the bedroom and we have differences inside the bedroom. And you really can't, usually speaking, we, most therapists say you have to have you know, success outside the bedroom in order to enjoy the bedroom. But there's so many couples that are good outside the bedroom and nothing's happening in the bedroom because they don't understand that you have to have new skills, insights, understandings in the bedroom as well. And, and that's just as important as outside. But clearly, if it's not working outside, usually one partner's unwilling to do it inside, the way of punishing their partner, or they're just shut down. You have to have the right hormones to enjoy sexual passion, and, and, and just loving your partner isn't enough.
Is that right? Now, uh, now I know we only have a, less than an hour, you know, today on this on this interview. And you you said that uh, at the beginning of the show that you you, you just spoke uh, eighteen hours on this topic. So it's a it's a big topic. But advice for women, because you've talked a lot about men or, or women want to be listened to, and women want you know for you to hear about their so, day. So what you're saying is advice for women to make their man happy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. So. Because, you know, we're two guys talking, so I'm talking about what we can do to be more successful in a relationship. What can women do to be more successful in the relationship? So I do a fun thing in my seminars. I say, man, what is, what is your job? You know, is your job to make her happy? No. What is your job? Our job is to create the safety for her to make herself happy. That's a grown-up. We're, see, as grown-ups, we're all capable of being happy. We should be responsible for our happiness. We're not children that are dependent on others. We're adults. We should be able to make ourselves happy. A marriage can make us happier, but there's a, you know, there's like a step. You have to learn to be happy and, you know, have self, some self-esteem and whatever. Then your partner can take you to a higher level. But we on our own, we're going to go up and down and women clearly go up and down. And not that men don't, but women, when they feel safe, they will sometimes be happy. Sometimes they'll be less happy. They'll come back and be happy and they'll be less happy and know they're like the weather. There's not a continuous state of happiness. If you, as a man, feel that it's your, your responsibility, if she's unhappy, you failed, then you're going to be unhappy with her. So, and, un, and you feel like unnecessary, like a failure. It's her job to be happy. His job is to create safety for her to, be, to make herself happy and then to make her happier when she is happy. For women, what's your job? Your job is to be happy. Your job to make a man happy. What do you do to make a man happy? You make yourself happy. If you're a happy wife, if you're a happy girlfriend, that man will be so happy to spend time with you because you give him the ability to easily make you happier. That's the dynamic. That's the most important thing for women today is learn how to be happy because they're not. And when they're unhappy, they say, well, when we fell in love in the first few years, we were happy. And that's because there's automatic kind of a drug that gets produced from the newness of a relationship. High levels of dopamine occur when it's new. Like a new song you haven't heard in yeah. a long time, you go, wow. But once you've heard it for a while, it's like, ah, turn the channels. No big deal. It's like we have to learn the skills that make the dopamine. And what women have to learn is, first of all, when you don't have the newness to easily create dopamine, you need to have skills to do it. And the skills for women is to stop depending on the man for your happiness, but to depend on yourself and know the things that will increase your estrogen, your oxytocin, your progesterone, these are all the different hormones, and when you can let them build up at the appropriate times of the month, then you will have healthy dopamine levels. If you don't have the right hormonal balance, you won't have the right dopamine levels, you won't have the right serotonin levels to sustain a passionate relationship. Now this sounds like, oh, you have to be a chemist. Yeah. No, you don't, have to, you don't have to take hormone tests, you don't have to do brain chemical tests, you just know that if you're feeling like you're not interested in your partner, you've been looking to them too much, you need to come back to doing things solo in your social life and in your taking me time life, things that you do for yourself, and women say, oh, but I'm too overwhelmed to do that. And I say, okay, anytime you're overwhelmed to, be, to do something for yourself, you're not giving your partner what they need. Because the foundation of what men need, you want a man to love you, he needs to feel he can make you happy. Even though it's part of his neurosis to think he can do it, he needs to feel I'm making you happier at least. So so, and, so if you could make a man feel like he's making you happy, that's a little yeah. trick technique yeah. that, uh, wow. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing about romance, dating. It doesn't, the woman doesn't open the door for the man. The man opens the door for the woman. The woman doesn't make the reservations at the restaurant. The man makes the reservations at the restaurant. Then, then when you go to the restaurant, you get all credit for it. You feel successful and she gets to feel taken care of. And of course, then you go into the whole romantic notions where women once again have this romantic notion that he's supposed to know everything I want. <laughs> he, she doesn't even know what she wants. You know, she says, let's go out to dinner. He says, okay, where do you want to go? She goes, I don't know. But she's the one who wants to go out to dinner. You know? And then you say, go here. She goes, no, no, I don't want to go there. Well, let's go here. No, no, I don't want to go there. Well, let's go here. I don't want to go here. So it's like understanding women when they're stressed, they can't make up their mind anyway. So when they're stressed, what you do is you already expect the first three things you suggest she's not going to like. So I, the one I want, I always put in later. 
because <laughs> she's got to talk for a while about why she doesn't like that idea. Because if I say, do you want to go to D'Angelo's for Italian food? She could say, no. I'm going to say, well, tell me about that. You know, get her to talk about it a little bit. Because I know that women clearly know what they want when their stress levels are down. But they need to talk a while about what they don't want, what they don't like, what's happened in their life. Then they can sort of relax and go, I know what I want. So when it comes to romance, here's one technique is every week I will uh, have a conversation with my wife about what to do next week. And, and just That's say, give, give me some ideas of some of the things you'd like to do and have kind of a discussion, what I like, what she liked. And then I say, let me pick. I'll pick one and I'll tell you tomorrow. That gives them a little suspense. And they're, they're like <laughs> anticipating. And then I always pick one that's what she wants, okay? It's not like I'm only going to do what you want, but I'm going to pick based upon all these little suggestions, ideas, because it's most romantic when a guy picks and decides what to do. So he's deciding. She doesn't have to decide because when you know when you take a woman on a date, you're always going to go, Gee, does she like it? Does she not like it? You know, That's a stress. Men can bear that stress much, much easier than women. That's your male side. It says, am I going to be successful? Am I not going to be successful? But if a woman is not saying what we're going to do, it's not her decision and she's in charge, then she doesn't have to worry about, is it going to be successful? Is it not going to be successful? If it fails, it's your fault. If it's successful, it's your fault. But the, but the dynamic, the rules are the man picks from what she wants. And because it's one of the things she wants, Never complain that it didn't work out the way you want. Your job then is to be really, really happy that he picked something you wanted and delivered. Now, now what about this whole idea of like love languages where at the beginning of a relationship, let's say I like being told, you know, that I'm funny and handsome, right? Let's just pretend that Do that's you? what I like to hear, right? Do you like to hear I'm handsome? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, <laughs> and she may like just to be hugged, right? But at the beginning of a relationship, you're doing the audio, visual, kinesthetic, you're telling them you love them, you're showing them you love them, giving them flowers, and then you end up kind of falling as time goes on, a year into it, six months, you start just doing what you like. Is, is there any truth to that? What, what are your thoughts well, there? Well, well there, there's, there's truth to what you said. There's a lot of truth to what you said. And there's a lot of other factors in there. You know, I love the book Love Languages, particularly for couples as kind of a beginner to understand that each person has their own preferences. But if you go through a very popular book, The Love Languages, the five preferences, I don't know any woman that doesn't want them all. And it's the female side wants all those things. And not one of them is emphasizing the fact that men need to have cave time. Men need to feel successful. Men need to make sure you never complain about them. There's all kinds of things that men need that men don't always know. You can't always articulate. For example, let me say a, a guy, let's say a guy doesn't feel... Let's say a guy wants a divorce and he says, I give and give and I never get back. I say, okay, well, what is it you get back, want to get back? I want messages that I'm successful. Not that I'm handsome, although that's nice. Nobody's going to turn down a compliment you're handsome, okay? But it's not what's going to raise your testosterone. Unless you really, you know, some men do value their looks more. That's sort of on their estrogen side, though. But that's, we all have a balance of masculine and feminine. But the bottom line is there's sort of these more basic biological needs that we have. And when I look over, you know, acts of service, okay, usually when they look at those five things, one of them is acts of service. What man is not going to say acts of service? <laughs> it says, of course. And what woman is not going to resent all the time because he gives her expressions of affection, but he never does any acts of service for her. Acts of service is something men have to overwhelmingly remember to do for women because our nature as men is to sort of go into never do anything you don't have to do. So we do these things in the beginning and we kind of settle down, back up, and do I have to keep doing that? Particularly because she's doing so many acts of service. What I see over and over is this dynamic of women will say when they want a divorce, I did all the acts of service and he just sat back and went to work and came home and that's all he did. And so. There's, so what's his excuse? Is. What's his excuse when she says that? Like, well, like, no, that does happen. Okay. Oh, well, oh, what happens in a dysfunctional marriage or an unhappy marriage is she says, you just go to work and you come home and you don't do anything for me. You don't listen to me. You're not yeah. affectionate anymore. We don't go on romantic dates. I don't feel loved by you. And I look what I do for you. I make you dinner. I do this for you. I'm always trying to get us to go out and do things and you never want to do anything. So she's over here feeling she's doing all this for the relationship and he's not doing much at all. So when I, when I explain to men, women are different, and I explain that you can make uh, $50,000. In your mind, that's 50 points or 50,000 points. 
Or you can make a hundred thousand dollars. In your mind, that's a hundred thousand love points. Or you can make a million dollars. That's a million love points. No, and when it comes to stimulating oxytocin and estrogen, it's one point. Fifty thousand is one point. Hundred thousand is one point. Million dollars is one point. Which the concept here is. What every act of love scores equal to every other act of love. Well, you went to work today. I'll give you a point for that. But you came home and you didn't do anything else. You get a point for coming home. You get a point for being my husband. That's three points. Why well, did those three things? And I made you dinner. So now it's four points. And, and he could say, but I make way more money than you. It doesn't matter. Hormonally, it doesn't matter. So when men understand it's a lot of little things is what stimulates the female hormones. So every day, for example, I give my wife at least four hugs a day. And you know, on that love language thing that when they say, some women might say, oh no, I don't like affection. That's her neurosis. It's not a real need. Okay, all women need affection. It's the number one oxytocin producer, stress reducer in women's bodies. But if a woman has gone, grown up a family with brothers and they ridiculed her female side, she's disconnected from her female side. So she should practice learning to appreciate and enjoy hugs. But it's not going to be her natural thing. For her, it's going to be acts of service. You know, she's going to that she's happy to give. So, but she so, won't feel she won't feel her need for the hugs is what I'm saying. Often people, their deepest needs, we, we have just the opposite reaction. Let me give you an example of that. A child who's never held doesn't want to be held later in life. Hmm. They will actually feel an aversion to being touched because every child needs to be held. And it's too painful to feel that need, so you deny the need. So here's a guy who didn't get the appreciation and admiration and, and acknowledgement from his parents. He was like a disappointment to his parents. Later in life, you know, his wife might say, wow, what a great job that did. He's like, oh, nothing, it's nothing, it's no big deal. I mean, it's what you do. Yeah. And he won't let it in instead of going, yeah, give me another round of applause. You know, I'm wonderful. And so, so people don't know what they need. They go in the wrong direction. So if I was just to ask people, okay, what do you need? Maybe some of them might be nice and uh, on the top. But this is a deep biological study of every human being that has a male has, has testosterone. There's certain things that stimulate it, and the estrogen, certain things that stimulate it. So we have to go beneath what people think they need and tell them what they need and show you how to start giving it to your so, partner. So, so a man that resents the compliments because he never lived up to his parents' expectations or whatever needs through your book and th can, can look at it and say, maybe I need to, to enjoy it and receive yeah, it. Yeah, learn and to the say woman, thank you. And the woman who's in your office that says, he's so needy, well, actually, maybe she just doesn't like getting a hug, that if she starts enjoying this human, that, that everything starts working better. That's right. That so a lot of, exactly, you hit it right on the bell. There's so many things that we think we want and we like and we need, just like we think we need sugar. You know, we have to have a dessert after a meal. You know, it's not what our body needs. It throws us out of balance, but we get addicted to these things that are the opposite of what we need. So take it back into the bigger picture, what we started out with, when women are more on their male side, what they think they need is more male stimulation. They're saying, I want more appreciation. I have to solve more problems. I stay busy, busy, busy. Even though at the same time, they're saying I'm doing too much. I don't have time for myself. I can't relax and they complain, but they're the ones who keep saying, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and they worry about this and they worry about this. Is when you go to your male side as a woman, it's harder to come back to your female side and the biggest obstacle is her. And for men, it's harder. Once a man gets angry, I say, stop talking. He starts talking more and more. He's got to like win and argue and defeat. And, I, and that's the wrong direction for him to go. Somebody has to show him how you're going out of balance. And, and this is a new culture that we're creating, which is based upon freedom for men to be both masculine and feminine, for women to be both feminine and masculine. But there has to be a new set of rules to, un to take responsibility for being happy within ourselves and behave properly to somebody else. Is your new book, is this your favorite book? Oh yeah, it's like a new baby and I'm just so excited about it. Men are from Mars will always be the classic understanding of how men and women are different, but this takes it to a whole new level for creating role, it's a shift from role mate relationships to soulmate relationships. And a soulmate is what most people want today. And by that, I define it as a relationship that supports you in expressing all parts of who you are, that nurtures you emotionally so you can express a deeper part of who you are, actualize yourself, and that's what keeps the passion there. You grow in love rather than a contentment relationship where at least you're not at war with each other. And Men Are From Mars is the basics of 
understanding where men and women come from and beyond Mars Venus is saying where we need to go. Because women go over to their male side, they need to come back to being from Venus, but also they have a male side. And men who, who are, are irritable and emotional and are addicted to things that are too far on their female side, how to come back to their male side that's more confident and control, more centered, and has more to give. So the book will make you happier, especially if you're married oh my gosh. or in any even relationship. Just, even just reading the book makes you happy. My <laughs> wife is now reading it. She is so happy. My daughter, when I oldest daughter, Lauren, she read it. She's so happy that the first two people that read it and it just makes such a difference. It that, just reminds you of the truth inside yourself of who you are because it gives you permission to be who you are. Society is not giving women permission to come back and be feminine. And society, society is really pushing men away from being masculine. You know, it's, it's making us too soft and too whiny and too emotional. Uh, that's not good. So men need to return to being men and women need to return to their feminine side. Well, I don't that, like to say it no. that way because a man's a man anyway. Okay, okay. <laughs> I don't, I'm not hard on it either. And women are women. You know, my wife is an amazing independent woman. She just needs help to balance her masculine with her feminine. And men can be so loving and nurturing. They need to also come back to their male side. They're at more calm, centered place, which are always in a positive mood wanting to be of service. You know, it's amazing. You know, in business, people will hire management consultants. They'll hire coaches. They'll go to seminars. But they... Most of us spend our time in relationships and we're not spending any time learning the rules or the strategies for a great relationship. Well, you said it really wonderfully. You know, I, I tell I give corporate talks as well and they always tell me, don't talk about relationships. Just talk about the work world. <laughs> and and I go, but if you learn these people go home to relationships, relationship ideally should be a source of lowering stress. So you go back to the work world, which is a source of greater stress, but you can cope with it better if you feel grounded in a sense of happiness and motivation and love. You can love your work more if you love your spouse more or if you have a, a loving personal life. But, you know, you can apply all this to the work world. It's still good information. But ironically, when I have question answer sessions, if I'm talking about gender differences, it always comes back to, oh, my husband, oh, my wife, because that's really what our lives are about. I mean, it's a big part of our lives. Well, I think, you know, my take home, I, I think anybody listening to this is, is men need to be better listeners and quit yeah. making it about us. Listen to their day. Maybe just because you work and they don't, you think that their day is inconsequential, but you're really destroying the relationship and ruining the passion according to you. Is exactly, that right? exactly. And if your wife says things that makes you angry, stop talking. Just say, hey, I hear you. Let me think about what you said. And then we'll talk again. That Just sounds like a tough one to do, by the way, in the heat oh, of the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's that's what you got to learn to do. And if you don't, that's why I got a whole book. That's like one of the concluding things. It makes sense to men because we associate anger with masculinity. And every man wants to be masculine, right? We're men. Okay. But being angry is actually female. It's being insecure. It's measurable in your hormones. Whenever you're angry, your estrogen is soaring, your testosterone wow. is going down. And so it gives you more of a reference point of where do I, who would I wanna be? How do I wanna behave? And yeah. if you become quiet, quiet silence will raise your testosterone. Talking when you're emotional will increase your estrogen. Interesting. Now, now you have a hypersensitivity toward when, when people are talking, maybe about their belief systems, et cetera. And I know you've been interviewed by some of the best, uh, Oprah Winfrey, Larry King, uh, I, I mean, Barbara Walters, right? Just to name a few. Are the men ask, who's, who's better at interviewing you about relationships? I'm thinking females, probably. What it just think? depends on who the audience is. Usually a man has, a, if, who, I speak to the audience, you know, so okay. when, when Oprah interviews me, it's always going to be about, you know, what trying to understand, teach men how to understand women better. Uh, a quick anecdote is one time Oprah had me come to a show to women who've been dumped and she wanted me to tell the women what they did wrong. I told her, you don't tell an angry woman what she did wrong. <laughs> You've got to listen to her for a long time about what he did wrong <laughs> and then she'll look at what she did wrong. And, but she, she said, just do it. Just tell them what they do wrong. And I did. And that they went on for three hours longer than the allotted time of these women were so stirred up and so upset <laughs> about the men in their lives. It was like, yes, but what about this? And yes, but what about this? And what about this? So I, I don't think there's a gender difference in who asked me the best questions on relationship. But, you know, uh, like Larry King would always, you know, it's, it's going to be a more 
analytical perspective. And, you know, and a, a female will often give more examples in her personal life and express more her feelings and what she needs uh, as, as a, but a man won't always do that. He'll sort of analyze the situation. You know, I like both. Larry King in his book about interviewing, I, I, I listened to his book and he said, you know, when you're interviewing somebody, just listen. Like if they say they're from Chicago, don't jump in and say, oh, I love the Windy City. I love Chicago. Just let them talk. That's a real interview. And it sounds like the same way what you taught me today is at the end of the day, when you're listening to your girlfriend, your spouse, your wife, partner, whatever, talk, don't butt in. Let them get it out, right? Now, you, you hear, that is such a key point. And just think about how well suited we are as men because doesn't almost every man want to come home and just sit in his chair and look at the screen and listen to some pretty woman give the news? <laughs> it's just to sit back. If we could just get, you don't have to do anything when your wife is giving the news of her day, just like wow. watching the news. Is it. It, we're really suited for it. It's very relaxing for men to watch the news of the day that they don't have problems they don't have to solve. So, so, that's, so why, it's that's why I emphasize for women, if you want him to listen better, Give him, talk about problems that he doesn't have to solve or say to him, there's no to do. There's no problem you have to solve. Yes. Then he's not thinking, okay, what do I have to do about this and interrupt with a solution? Because, you know, I, I guess some men will say, I'm just not a good listener like that. You know, I can't listen. Then you could actually give him that news example. Do you ever watch That's the right. news? You're not saying a word back. There's no interaction. So you are a good listener. We're great listeners. Interesting. It's just that when, when it's the news, it's not something we have to, nobody's asking us to do something. Right. When our wives talk to us, we assume that if she's talking about a problem, she's asking us to do something for her. And the challenge there, sometimes they are. So then I tell women, you need to tell him that you don't have to do anything about this. There's no to do. This is an FYI and I do it just to get close to you. Okay, very nice. Now, where, where can we get your book? Where's the best place? And do you have an audio book uh, available as well? Yeah, there, it's coming out, the full audio book, un, unshortened, it's coming out soon. But the book is, uh, well, they're at all booksellers, but if you go to marsvenus.com, it will link you to different online booksellers, and then you also get to put in your receipt number, and you get a free download or a three-hour seminar from me on the secrets of great sex. So that's my incentive for people. That's a limited time offer to go and get that book and you can get also a three hour uh, audio seminar. Okay, John, great stuff, uh, great information and uh, we'll have to have you back. Thanks again for coming on the Terrific. program. Terrific, great interview, thank you so much. Thanks.